CCY America presents Crosstalk, a nationwide call-in program discussing issues that have an effect on our families, our communities, our churches, our nation, and our world. Crosstalk, an opportunity for you to voice your concerns for biblical principles. And now live by satellite and around the world on the Internet at vcyamerica.org. Here is today's Crosstalk. Well, thank, thank you, Gordon Morris, and welcome to Crosstalk. I, uh, if I was to give our show a title today, it would be Biotechnology and the Future of Man. You might say, Vic, that sounds way off the charts. Well, today's program may seem like the realm of science fiction or some wacky conspiracy website, but unfortunately, the science is here to alter the human body. And our guest today recently sent out an open letter to Christians about biotechnology and the future of man. Our guest is Thomas Horn. He is an internationally recognized lecturer, former radio host, and best-selling author of several books, including Apollyon Rising 2012, The Lost Symbol, uh, Found and Final Mysteries of the Great Seal Revealed, Uh, He's a well-known columnist uh, whose articles have uh, been referred to by many writers of the L.A. Times Syndicate, MSNBC, Christianity Today, New Man Magazine, World Net Daily, Newsmax, and uh, White House Correspondents and dozens of other magazines. He's with us today. We're going to talk about this issue, uh, which is more than a pipe dream. And I want to say a special welcome to Thomas Horn. Tom, uh, Tom, nice to have you with us. Well, thank you for having me on your program, Vic. Tom, uh, recently you released an open letter to Christian leaders on biotechnology and the future of man. Tell us what this is all about. Yeah, well, I released that letter um, to Christian leaders. I have to tell you that so far it has resulted in more secular response (laughs) than it has from Christians, though I am receiving some good response from Christians and pastors who want to know how they can get involved in the the debate on both... um, what I call grand technologies, genetics, robotics, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology. Well, you know, Tom, we don't have to go too far back, uh, at least in my life. I'm older than some, but uh, there was a guy named Adolf over in Germany that was busy with biotechnology and uh, creating the super race. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Adolf Hitler. Uh, he has dreamed to create Nietzsche's overman, the ubermensch, the superior man. And actually what's happening now here in the United States and around the world through the transhumanist philosophy, uh, we now say we don't, you know, we, no, we can build the ubermensch. We no longer need to wait on the uh, daunting task of evolution. Uh, we can take control of our future, of our biology. We can enhance ourselves cognitively. We can rewrite our DNA. We can produce Homo superior 2.0. You know, Tom, this scares me. It reminds me in a different vein, however, of the Tower of Babel, Mm -hmm. where people rose up and they're going to build themselves a tower to heaven. They're going to take over. And uh, going from the creation side of it, this is scary. Well, and others have drawn parallels to, um, and this gets into kind of a sticky theology, but the whole idea behind the Watchers and the Nephilim, yeah. uh, this aberration, this corruption of human DNA yeah. in ancient times, and is uh, and are we now essentially repeating a kind of forbidden science that ultimately in those days led to the flood, according to many people's theology? Well, you know, it was, I think it was way back in 1984 or earlier where people were talking about uh, the possibility of creating subhumans to do the grunt work. I mean, to me, that's abominable speech. It, it's, it's blasphemous, practically. If mankind is a, is a creator, creation of God and in his image, and then you talk about subhumans, uh, I mean, this kind of rhetoric's been floating around a while. Yeah, well, Dr. Joseph Flesher, he's a Harvard University professor, was one of the guys you might have actually even been quoting, and that was what he said, that chimeras, human-animal crossbreeds, parahumans, could be legitimately fashioned to do dangerous, demeaning jobs uh, as an outgrowth of this science. So there's all kinds of applications in terms of it being almost like a new form of eugenics where we can create a superior man but we could also perhaps create subclasses of individuals i've been on dr james hughes on his change surfer radio show which is a syndicated radio show and he is one of the world's leading transhumanist advocates he's a professor of of bioethics um 
at uh, at a university I probably shouldn't mention here in the sure. United States, but I've been on his show, and he actually wants to uh, upgrade um, monkeys and great apes to a po- uh, to the point where they would have basic cognitive skills. Let's say maybe something uh, along the the lines of an average five or six year old child. And he wants to do that as a way of being able to show that personhood, which is a transhumanist theme, is what we should um, is what uh, should provide for constitutional protection. So that if a person like Terry Schiavo, for instance, loses cognitive ability, she would no longer be classified as a person, no longer protected under the Constitution yep. or the Bill of Rights, and therefore we could harvest her organs or do whatever we wanted to do. Yep. So this whole line of thinking ultimately could lead to non human humans or persons and non uh, and and uh, and and just the opposite of that persons who are non persons or non human yeah Tom what is uh, into the simplest of our minds here today what is transhumanism well transhumanism is a is a cultural movement that started probably 25 years ago sometime around the time that the genetics movement actually started making hay, if you will, the, the um, uh, decoding of the human genome gave birth to this idea that we could use technology to take us into our next step in human evolution. And so essentially, that's just the title that got stuck to that line of thinking, transhumanism. Transhumans see themselves as going from being human Transhuman is a, tran- a transitional state where we begin to alter ourselves, including uh, cybernetic enhancement, that sort of thing, but ultimately also germline engineering where we start rewriting essentially our genetic code. And then ultimately the goal is to arrive at posthumanism, which will be uh, a creature that is so far in advanced, evolutionarily speaking, of what humans are today as to no longer even be considered to be a human. You know, as as I see this, and as a Christian, I see this as blasphemous. I mean, blasphemy against God's creation. I mean, this issue of mankind, of course, playing around with the genetics. We saw what happened with Hitler's, uh, what the outcome, of course, was that. But then we talk about cloning. And first of all, they were talking about just cloning animals and high restrictions, and then, of course, the restrictions go down. Uh, then you talk about uh, cell, uh, the stem cell research, and of course, uh, adult stem research. But they want to know they would rather work from stem cells that come from killed babies. Right. And so you see the downward trend of this of this crazy and, in my terms, wicked mentality. Well, it certainly is an assault on God's creative genius. It is an assault on the divine order. But we have to ask ourselves, what does God know that we don't know in which he placed barriers between the species and ordered that each kind reproduce after its own kind? But look at what we're doing. You talk about stem cell harvesting. Most of that is through the production of chimeras. It's actually the creation of a human-animal chimera because you can circumvent the law. See, it's against the law to experiment on humans unless you get FDA approval. But but there is no law that says if I create something that is part human and part monkey, I can do all kinds of testing on that. And we're doing it in laboratories around the world. We're doing it all throughout the United States, Australia, the United Kingdom, the embryology discussions out of the United Kingdom two years ago in which the Vatican stepped in and said, well, if a woman participates in the providing of ovum uh, or eggs for the production of a part human, part animal, and then later on grows a conscious and and wants to be able to raise that chimera as her own offspring, she ought to have the right to do so. And so it started introducing how much tortured logic there is in this, Vic. But here's what I... The reason that I got involved in this whole discussion Mm -hmm. is... Excuse me, is that We've gone from the theoretical phase of this into the early ideological arguments and now even taxpayer-funded reports. I I would venture to say that most of your listeners don't know that that 
<coughs> excuse me, that at the Case Law School in Cleveland, Ohio, for instance, over the last 30 months, they, they were the recipients of a $773,000 grant from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, which is the largest U.S. department that provides grants for research into human health issues. And it's your tax dollars. It's our tax dollars, and the whole you, uh, you can look the press release on this up, or if somebody wants to email me, I can send them a copy of the press release that came from, uh, this is Case Law School's own press release, where they described that the whole purpose behind this grant was to, uh, to provide funding for Professor Max Melman to lead a team of uh, professors and lawyers, bioethicists and whatever, over a two-year period for the express purpose, Vic, of establishing the guidelines that will be used for setting public policy around human enhancement as the next step in evolution. This was, this was a taxpayer-funded uh, study. Another one, the, the new U.S. National Science Foundation report, The Ethics of Human Enhancement, 25 Questions and Answers, which was a grant that was given, of course, uh, for the writing of, of that document. The, the, I don't want to get it bogged down in details here, um, but, but the, the, that government report is also available at our website. If people want to go to ForbiddenGate.com. They can download the 50-page report and read what they just funded, and they'll be amazed. Here's the opening line in this taxpayer-funded report. It's a new report. Quote, It is not just the world around us that we desire to change. Since the beginning of history, we also have wanted to become more than human, to become homo superior. From the godlike command of Gilgamesh to the lofty ambitions of Icarus to the preternatural strength of Beowulf, to the mythical skills of Shaolin monks, and to various shamans and shapeshifters throughout the world's history, we have dreamt and still dream of transforming ourselves to overcome our all-too-human limitations, end quote. And then they go on to make the case how that we are now at the start of the human enhancement revolution. Even military think tanks, the Jasons, which is the which is the top think tank at the Pentagon now consider human enhancement to be the next arms race. Lord help us. When I when I think of, uh, I mean, it, it leaves you sick to your stomach when you think about this thing, and uh, the idea. I mean, it, first it was playing around with steroids and people, uh, football players, working on enhancing their ability. You know, and and. Uh, then you, you see uh, the, the use of drugs to, quote, enhance athletes, where people go out and spend millions of dollars to, to watch these enhanced athletes parade their, their prowess. But uh, what we're talking about here, folks, is absolutely worthy of your attention. And when you see the world turning to something as, as absolutely frightening as this, I think it's time that Christians take a serious look at it. Uh, you say the pastors have responded. Has it been a strong pastoral response? Uh, you know, it has not been as strong as I would have hoped for, but partly I think it's just this is an uphill battle. Uh, I've been called by the Washington Times and others probably the leading thinker. I don't know how I ever wound up here, by the way, because <laughs> I certainly don't have any degrees in genetics. Uh, uh, but it, it was just something I became interested in, and I guess God puts us where we're supposed to be at the right time. And um, but I have had some I have had some very positive signals too. There are um, we we wrote a book on this by the way called Forbidden Gates, mm -hmm. and it's going to be out November one. And the reason we wrote the book was to put all of the government documents. We we've, we've got copies of DARPA's 2011 presidential budget in the budget, providing millions of dollars for actually editing human DNA. Uh, they 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 want to build uh, a creature called Bio Design, oh, which brother. We're going to be right back in just a few moments. The break is up here. We shall return in just a moment. Back to Genesis with Dr. John Morris, scientist with the Institute for Creation Research. Dr. Morris, as unique as the giraffe is, how did it get its long neck? Chris, an evolutionary story has it that during drought, those animals with long necks could eat leaves higher up in the trees. They survived while the others went extinct. Even though this story is told and retold in evolutionary circles, it's not even a little bit true. The giraffe has many precise design features to support its body style. 
For instance, a heart which will pump the blood all the way up to the head and then traps in the blood vessels to keep the head from exploding when the giraffe puts his head down to drink from the lake. There's much more to a giraffe than just a long neck. Everything about him is designed to be just this. Modern-day giraffes are very well adapted to the environment to fill an ecological niche. They were designed to do so. They did not evolve. And that's how I see it from a Back to Genesis perspective. For more on Genesis, visit us on the web at icr.org. 